So today I'll talk about how can you generate entangled microwave radiation using superconducting system and I'll raise a few applications of these kind of uh, entangled sources. Um, in principle, what I will talk about is generating stationary entangled radiation and, and also microwave quantum illumination. The point which mainly related these two topics is just entanglement. In the first part of my talk, I will uh, briefly go through uh, the generation of entanglement in a nanomechanical structure, mainly in superconducting system, and then I'll use this entanglement for the, uh, for the quantum illumination. So let's start with the first part. Uh, what's the main goal we are usually pursuing is if we build quantum computer in future, that probably would be in the, super, uh, in the electronic uh, devices. Either superconducting system or semiconductor, they are using electrical signals and these electrical signals usually they are at microwave ranges and easily you cannot take out information from, uh, uh, from these devices and transfer them, transfer them somewhere else because they are super lossy and, and very uh, uh, weak with respect to environmental noises. Um, and another reason is usually we have to cool down these devices, the, uh, the cryogenic fridges, and that requires a lot of, again, um, attention in order to, to take information from these devices. So one way is just making a link between superconducting system, for example, and the optical photons, because, because you can use, for example, fiber and optical photons, they are really good, they are low loss, and usually environmental noises for these devices are almost negligible. So there's a lot of ways, um, a lot few ways to really attaching or just bridging optic to microwave. And one of the ways just using the radiation pressure, which it's, I don't claim is the best way, but I would say is the uh, very advanced technique to really couple microwave wall to optical wall. And more specifically, I'm really interested in using optomechanical interaction, which I will explain to you what's the optomechanical interaction. And I showed you, if you just have a, a vibrating membrane, you can share this vibrating membrane between microwave world and optical world, and using this to convert information from one to other. Let's see how is that working. Um, very briefly, what is optomechanical system? The optomechanical system is something like that. You have an optical cavity, which you have two mirrors. One of the mirrors is totally fixed and solid. The other one is, is very light. Meaning that if you have photons, which I, here I showed it with A, the number of photons you have, for example, this is the annihilation operator of the photons, it can kick the, the mirror here, therefore you can kind of constructing a kind of interaction between photons and mechanical vibration. So what do you have? You have photons and phonon here, and based on that you can make optomechanical interaction with the system. The Hamiltonian describing this system is totally nonlinear, here, and that's, that's given by this, this form here. And if you're looking at that, you don't need to know really about quantum mechanics. This is really energy, and you know if you have force and then displacement, the energy is what? The energy is F that X. So F here is the forces coming from the photons, and B plus B dagger is just X, the displacement. So you have F that X, this is the Hamiltonian describing the interaction. So you can, uh, in principle, linearize this Hamiltonian and, and finding um, a slightly simplified form, which is something like that. If you pick up, you could just pay attention that we, have, we could have a different type of the uh, uh, elements here and combine all of them in different uh, uh, kind of forms. But what two types for me is very interesting, and one of them is the beam split interaction. So in a beam split interaction, we could destroy phonons and create photons, or the other way around. And this is nothing more than beam split interaction, which you're familiar with. You can use this, this kind of thing for photon conversion. And how is that working? Let's uh, just bring an example, which we've, we, we implemented purely in the microwave domain for now. And I will show you how is that possible in the optical domain. Um, what you see here is a, is a silicon wafer which we have, and we have those coils here. Those coils are nothing than, more than the LC circuit. You know, from Feynman lectures, you know, if you have an LC circuit, that's a resonator for you, which is 
working in a microwave domain. So what do you have? You have inductance here and then a capacitance here, another inductance here, capacitance here, another one, and the capacitance here. So all of them, they're sharing one big capacitance right there on top of the sample. Um, so if you cleave the sample, if you just cut the sample through, the, what you see here, you see we have a huge membrane here, and that membrane is floating here, and this, this gap is something like 3 micron. So the entire thing is just really a floating uh, structure. So, but if I just mainly focus on this area, which is the heart of my sample, what you see, I have a capacitance here, and this capacitance is a very long one, and those gaps here, not this big one, this and this part, they are just fluctuating, they're vibrating. And this vibration is shared between the three LC circuits we have. This gap in principle, if you focus on this gap, this gap is something like 40 nanometer. We can just fabricate a sample which is a 40 nanometer gap. And you can use the fluctuation rises from these two gaps here in order to modulate the resonant frequencies of the LC circuit and Intuitively, you can just looking at that as a kind of bridge which linking the different microwave uh, 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 resonators we, we have on the chip and convert energy between them. So this was the uh, uh, kind of sample we fabricated. And intuitively, you can just looking at the entire chip in this kind of uh, uh, schematic form. So we have one LC circuit, two, and the third one. And all of them, they're sharing one mechanical mode here. And this mechanical mode could have different uh, uh, vibrational mode, mode one and mode two. So with that, I'm, I'm able to convert energy from one to other, or from here to here, or from here to here in a bidirectional way. And if you're looking at the, uh, the experiment we have done, or mainly the theory, again, we have a beam splitter interaction, we have two resonators and a mechanical uh, mode here. We drive this, the, the, the microwave resonator off resonance from the cavity, which is a kind of like right side band coupling in principle. This is, you have a process like a Raman scattering in this factory, which photons can, uh, you can convert photons to phonon the other way around. If you, if you go through the theory, what you find is the transmission between one resonator to another resonator through the mechanic is given by um, uh, this, this uh, equation here which is written based on the cooperativity of, of the interaction. What is cooperativity? Here, what you see in the cooperativity, in principle, you compare the interaction between cavity uh, and mechanic with respect to the losses you have in the system. Gamma and kappa are the loss mechanism uh, appears in the system. So immediately, you can guess that if C is bigger than 1, what do we have? The coupling is stronger than the loss mechanism in the system, and that's very good, no? because you can easily convert photon from one to other and using the mechanical system. So this is the experimental data with respect to theory, what we had. Um, this is the transmission of the system between one resonator to another resonator with respect to cooperativity, and these are the reflection of the system. So we have, it's still, it's not one, but we can easily, in the, in the, in the next generation, we would be able to really push this to one. It's kind of like very, um, now easy for us to do this. What is more interesting is, you know, you have the reflection, the system, the red, and you have the yellow, the transmission, and there is a point which you almost have uh, half here. So what is that? In a beam splitter, what do you have? If, if you have a 50-50 beam splitter, with 50% the photons can pass, with 50% they can just reflect, and this is exactly what happens. So what do we, do we have? We just not only have a, a photon converter, we also have a unchip beam splitter for the microwave domain. <clears throat> so this was one of the um, experiments we have done, but what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to really link the optical domain to microwave domain using exactly the same technique. So if you have a mechanical system, which you share this mechanical system between optical and microwave domain, you exactly can go through the same process, which through the mechanical system, you can make an indirect link between the optic and microwave domain using the same type of structure, which you have the photons and phonons here between optic and microwave. And at like cooperativity around 10, you could expect something like 90% efficiency between optic and microwave domain. But this turns out to be extremely complicated experiment. And this is the sample we worked on it for like <clears throat> four years, the last, three, uh, last four years. And this is the result of uh, what we fabricate. It's quite complex structure. 
So what do we have for the first time we integrated the optical and microwave domain in one specific ch uh, chip? So what do we have? We have 220 nanometer uh, silicon, this, this layer here. This is three micron gap, and this, this is the silicon, the sample handler. We have uh, microwave part here, this inductance, and we have optical part there, which is the photonucleosol we have on top. And they are sharing this part, they are sharing one mechanical element between <clears throat> the two frequencies. So how uh, did we uh, just fabricate the sample? We have photonucleosol, this breathing mode here, and we have a dielectric here. The dielectric, uh, the nano, uh, this nano string is, is just have a vibration share with the microwave. This one is shared with, with the optical part. With that, we are able to really couple the optical microwave, and we got a kind of like one person efficiency is not amazing, but it's really still a big step toward uh, having fully op uh, a kind of operational micro to optical converter. But it's not really quantum yet. It adds something like 80 quanta during the conversion. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> we are working on this to improve this further and, and going above 50%, which up, uh, after probably we can do some quantum mechanic uh, experiment with this. Another type of interaction which is very interesting for us, instead of beam split, is the parametric type interaction, which you're again familiar with. What is parametric type interaction? Instead of having this, now I mix the other terms, which you have A dagger and B dagger, A, B. This is known in, in quantum optic community because you can use this to generate entanglement or the squeezing in the quantum systems. Let's see how can we do that using the optomechanical interaction. Um, so the way we are doing it, we, we again have two cavities or two resonators shared with one mechanical system, but instead of driving them from red sideband, we drive one of them from red sideband while the other one is drive from blue sideband. How is the physics mechanism working here? It's pretty simple. One of them cools down the mechanic, the other one heats it up. We kick the mechanic with another traction, and if you're writing the Hamiltonian, you end up to this type of Hamiltonian, and it's now that you can use that for the amplification of squeezing. And as I theoretically proposed during my PhD, you can use it for generating entanglement and teleportation between microwave and optic, or using it for the quantum illumination or more spe specifically building a quantum radar, which I will come back to this at the end of my talk. So, um, yeah, this was the problems I, I, uh, we tackled uh, last, uh, during the last two years. So what we had, we just fabricated something like this, which we had two cavities, uh, which they, both of them are sharing one mechanical object. And we looked at the output of these cavities, and we proved that, hey, the output of this, uh, they are entangled. <clears throat> In order to prove the entanglement, I have to looking at the quadratures of the outputs, and looking at the correlation between the output of the cavity and see if they are entangled. How do we do that? This is the sample we fabricated. We had, again, two LC circuits, one and two, and they are sharing a big capacitance here. Again, the entire thing is in the, in the floating membrane, and we have uh, uh, the capacitance, again, in, the, in this form. Uh, we have a, a nanostring here. What was very, uh, really, um, a point here was we improved the coupling between microwave and optical domain to 180 hertz, which this is for one side. So if you just have one coil and one mechanic, you can easily go up to 400 hertz, which is kind of like uh, really a kind of record in our community because the best people could achieve something like 200 to 250 hertz, which was very good uh, improvement. So then we cool down the sample uh, and put it in the bottom of the cryogenic fridge. So we have the sample here. We have the outputs of the, uh, of the resonators like this, which we, we probed them from these transmission lines. Um, and then we looked at the entanglement at the output of this, which they are propagating one meter away from each other. So whatever I'm talking about is about entanglement, which they are propagated, and they are far from each other by one meter at these two points. <clears throat> then we amplify them, down converting them to at, at room temperature and uh, have done the post-processing to capture all of the correlation yet. So this is the result. <clears throat> what do you see here? This is the, um, um, this is the quasi-probability distribution, all of the combination you could ever come up with between 
the output of the resonator one and resonator two, uh, they, they're uh, labeled with two and one here. So four of them are Gaussian, but two of them are um, squashed. <clears throat> this squashing could be a kind of like a trace of, again, existing squeezing or entangling the system. So we reconstructed the covariance matrix. As you see, the, LM, the, the diagonal term of the covariance matrix, they are almost in the same size, but we have non-zero of the diagonal term. The non-zero of the diagonal term, it, it contains um, uh, the correlation between the two microwave uh, uh, resonators, the photons of the microwave resonator. So we looked at the Wigner function. Uh, this is the Wigner function with respect to the vacuum noise. You see you are squeezed below the vacuum noise. And we also look at, looked at the squeezing, which we are squeezed below vacuum by like 4 dB squeezing. So that is a solid indication of existing entanglement uh, in our quantum device. We also looked at the EPR bound violation uh, using the um, Duane inequality. So if you really go below one, you can you you sure that the state you generate is entangled state. But there was something more interesting here. It was a kind of question because I wanted to use this for a kind of quantum radar, which I'll I will tell you about it. Um, and that was a quantum discord. So I want to use the correlation at room temperature if something left, because whatever we're doing, it's really at low temperature. You know, the microwave frequency, they're really uh, weak with respect to environmental noises, so if I could still have some correlation left in the photons, probably I can use that for something more uh, interesting. And that was what I calculated, quantum discord at low temperature. We have none definitely negligible quantum discord. And then we added all of the noises of uh, existing at room temperature in our measurement chain, and surprisingly, we found non-zero quantum discord in, in our device. So beside, we work in microwave domain, beside we have a lot of noises um, uh, just kick in, we still have non-zero quantum correlation in our system, which we can use that for, um, for, uh, for quantum sensing, which I will um, just present in the next slide. Okay, so in the first part, I showed you how can we generate entanglement. Now, how can we use this, this entanglement and, and, and getting some application out of this. And that's the definition or the meaning of the quantum radar which we recently implemented. How is that working? So before um, going through the definition of quantum illumination, let's see how the, quant uh, the classical radar is work. In the classical radar, you have a light source, like this laser pointer. You just send the, the, the signal or the photons through a region which is suspected to have a target there or not. So if something reflects back, we are sure there is some reflective object there and we can probe the region and can find out there is something. We can find out about the information encoded in the area besides there is a lot of noise there. This is a super efficient way, but the question is can we improve the sensitivity of this using quantum principle? The answer is yes. And that's the definition of quantum illumination. It's a kind of quantum optical sensing technique which is using the quantum correlation in general to improve the sensitivity of the sensor you have. How is that working? I will tell you in the next slide. Mainly you have entangled source, you generate idle and signal, you keep your idle in your pocket, but you send a signal to your region which is suspected to have a target or not. We don't know. We do what, whatever we know, we have an extremely noisy environment and then whatever reflects back from that, we do a kind of cross measurement between the item signal, and then we will find out about the existence of target there or not. What is really good about quantum illumination is, you can think of the quantum illumination in the worst case ever you come to your mind, meaning that extremely noisy environment, so you have very high temperature, a lot of noises, a lot of losses, whatever you can really think about it, the worst case ever for the quantum mechanic, which you always want to avoid it, meaning that noises, losses, decoherence, and all of the conditions you, can, you could ever come up with. If you have even these conditions, you can show that the, the principle of quantum correlation uh, and, and quantum illumination allows you to beat the best um, quantum, uh, the classical radar you have um, um, in this regard. How can we prove that? So theoretically, 
this is what do we have. We have an entangled pair. We detect the idler um, perfectly. This entangled pair, it's like my mechanical system. I showed you how to generate entanglement between idler and signal in a superconducting system. You detect your idler, but use your signal. You send your signal to a region which is suspected to have a target there or not. So I come up, uh, the, if, if you're looking at the output of this, the output of this uh, entangled source is given by this. And if I looked at the covariance matrix, the covariance matrix is given by this. The diagonal term tells you how much photons do you have in idle and signal, while the off-diagonal term explains the correlation between idle and signal uh, in, in principle. Now I come up with two hypotheses. Hypothesis H0 is there is no target. So what do we have? I send a signal to a region which is, there is nothing reflected. So what do you expect? The only thing I expect is I just have a lot of noises there. So what reflects back is just noise. That's the noise, A, B. So I label this with bath. It's a noises, the environmental noises we have, which is extremely bright noises, source of uh, noises we have. So the, under hypothesis H1, we have a kind of target there, but reflectivity of this target is very negligible. It's really small. So I'm assuming I have a reflective object. So very small amount of signal reflects back in this chain. What you get, the reflected signal, it's uh, AR. It contains a little bit of the initial signal you have with a lot of noises added through the chain. So here, in principle, I assume the very bad case, which NB, the noises we have for the bass, for the background noise, is much bigger than the signal. So under this condition, I can again, looking at the covariance matrix, the diagonal term, when there is no target, they are modified a bit, but the off-diagonal term, they totally wash out. So there is no object which contain the reflected signal. But under hypothesis H1, what do we get? We have a little bit of the correlation left in our calculation, and that's proportional to the kappa, the reflectivity of our signal. So depend which kind of uh, detection um, procedure do you have, if you have a phase conjugator or optical parametric converter uh, amplifier, which you mix the, the reflected signal in idler and then do the photo detection and balance photo detection, or using optical parametric amplifier to mix them, you can theoretically predict that the quantum illumination, uh, if you're looking at the noise, uh, the, the error with respect to the number of copies you send, it's way better than the, the best uh, uh, classical scenario with the current state with homodyne measurement. What's the difference in language of SNR is six dB better than the current state. This is a theory prediction. Um, so what's, what are the benefits? You can use quantum illumination and you can claim it's non-invasive, meaning that you can use a little bit of photons. So we just use less than one photon to, to probe a very noisy region and we know the noise we have is extremely bright. And you can show that the efficiency or, or the, the sensitivity of this quantum radar is much better than classical, any best scenario in a classical domain. But what are the problems? We still don't know what's the optimum receiver you can design to capture 6 dB improvement predict by theory. And we don't have microwave version of the quantum illumination. But why microwave domain is important? Because in the optical domain, we work in a few hundred terahertz. In a few hundred terahertz, the background noise are almost negligible, totally zero. But if you just push down the frequency to the gigahertz frequency, you have a lot of thermal noise in the environment. So if, in principle, you would be able to um, have the quantum illumination in microwave domain, you could go for the proof of principle of the quantum illumination, like, and probably using it for something which is very useful. And this was the experiment we have done recently. Uh, instead of using the mechanical system as an entangled source, we used Josephson parametric converter. It was a kind of like a Josephson-based sample which generates entanglement for you at low temperature. We detected the idler perfectly, but we use signal and send it through a region at room temperature, and, and we run the quantum illumination protocol. How is that working? We had our JPC at 7 millikelvin. We had idler detected, 
and we had signal, and I know either and signal they're entangled. We amplified it and then um, used this chain to test the quantum illumination. What is that? We, in, in one arm, this, the signal can either go through this arm or this arm. In this arm, we had a step attenuator, which we imposed up to 30 dB loss in our signal to just mimic the existing of the target. And then we went to really free space uh, measurement, meaning that we got the signal coming out from our fridge, we used a horn-shaped antenna, and we probed the region with this antenna. So we really had a free space link here. I just put the object there in front of this antenna, and the signal reflects back from that. I collected with another horn-shaped antenna, and we, if that, we detect the signal, um, and then after that, in all of the post-processing uh, 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 procedure, we just looked at the correlation and reconstructed the SNR of the system. So you can claim this is really a real kind of room temperature application of what people are really trying to do in a, a micro domain, especially in the superconducting system. Okay, so first of all, um, it, as, a, as a kind of like checking point, I also run the measurement with the current state, which it should be the best scenario you can ever come up with. And also the correlated classical noise, which I would be able, I'm, I'm able to generate a kind of classical correlated signal between item and signal and, and repeated this, exactly the same measurement to compare the result. First of all, let's look at the entanglement. This is the entanglement measure. You know, if, if you exceed this one, you're entangled. And this is what we have, the data point for the Josephson parametric converter. We, we are entangled. This is obvious. With respect to the photons number you have, which they are pretty low, just pay attention to the numbers, it's just we really go up to five photons at the output of our sample, and they're entangled. But entangled gradually disappear here at the high power. And we compare the result with the classically correlated one, and you see the classically correlated one, they cannot exceed one, and then when you rise the number of photons, it's starting to uh, disappear. So one is not entangled, the other one is entangled. Let's see how, what's the effect of entanglement in our uh, measurement efficiency. So we compare the SNR, signal to noise ratio, with respect to NS for three scenarios, quantum illumination, coherent state, which it's supposed to be the best um, kind of classical measurement you can ever do, and the quantum, uh, the classical correlated one, the red one. So what is really interesting is in the point which entanglement is gone, when you don't have entanglement, the quantum illumination is not really better than the current state. It's a kind of clear indication of the quantum entanglement to improve the sensitivity of your, uh, of your device. So we also looked, as I mentioned, we had uh, a step attenuate in our chain. We imposed up to 25 dB um, loss in our chain. Um, and, and, and compare the three cases. Uh, so what do we get was the quantum illumination still is way better than um, the current state and the classical correlated structure. In a free space domain, which we use a, a horn-shaped antenna, we compare the SNR with respect to um, uh, distance. I went to up to one meter away so what happened after one meter it doesn't work really because the signal is really weak and then we cannot really detect. We reach the sensitivity of our classical devices like digitizer. You could use a better amplifier probably, you could push this a bit uh, to something like two meters, but we didn't do that. We compared uh, the, again, it's a bit noisy data, but this is in the free space, totally expected. The SNR which, uh, for the three cases, the quantum illumination is still better than the other two cases in, in our scenario. So, conclusion, um, we use the quantum electromechanic. We could use that for generate um, a photon conversion. You can use that for converting micro photons to optical photons. We use this for, um, uh, for um, generating entanglement between uh, the microwave uh, photons in principle. And then we use that kind of entangled sources to, uh, to really use it for the quantum sensing and design a kind of quantum radar in a, in, in a microwave domain. Yeah, thank you for your attention. As I mentioned, I will move to University of Calgary. I have many PhD and postdoc positions available if you are really interested to work in these areas. Well, that was super fast, actually. <laughs>
All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we have plenty <coughs> of time for questions. <coughs> So a simple question. So experimentally, how do you step, how do you prove that your detector shot noise limited? Um, because for squeezing and that, this is well. We, in microwave, we not really talk about the shot noise thing. The point is, uh, we calibrating our system. So we have a calibration chain before doing any measurement. We generate a kind of um, artificial. We have an artificial source of noise in our fridge. And then using that, we are really calibrating the entire measurement, including the noises at in the in the our instrument, to find out about all of the characteristic of our sound, uh, our chain, including the added noise, and the gain. And then using that, we just really um, calibrating our idler because we had to uh, really detect our idler perfectly. Yes. But the signal, we don't care. The signal, a lot of noise is coming in. But what is really important about microwave is we have a huge amount of gain in the fridge before reaching the sample, yes. the, the, the device. And that overwhelming all of the uh, uh, shot noise or all of the noises come from the instrument. So we don't really care about that. In microwave, that's why I'm saying because we have a lot of gain. We have, we're talking about like 9 dB gain in our measurement chain. The only reason I ask the question is because when you're inferring squeezing, the question is that you so you, you had your coherent state, you, sh you show the correlations, but if your coherent state is noise amplified, then I mean we at NTT we work with nanomechanical mechanical systems, and basically in these particular cases our, we're not shot our coherent states are not shot shot noise, they're much wider, so we can see what looks like apparent squeezing, but it's not. So I was wondering how you distinguish it in this yeah. case. Well. First of all, the entanglement I showed you, it's at low temperature. Yep. So we don't claim anything about the existing entanglement at, at room temperature. So the way we just go back to the low temperature from room temperature is, as I said, we really calibrating the entire measurement chain very carefully. So the way we do that, we have a, um, uh, we have a, a thermal load in our fridge, which we can locally change the, the temperature of this, so we can go from like midi Kelvin temperature to like four Kelvin temperature. And with that, you can accurately back out the added noise even through the measurement devices. So we really calibrate out everything, including the imperfection in our detection chain and the device we have. And then we back out the correlation and entanglement at low temperature. Um, could you also do a direct intensity correlation measurement uh, for the elimination part? Because I, I think this is no. what... No. So this is a very good point. If you, if you do the linear detection, which is for me linear, that's defined as homodyne or heterodyne, um, you will not get anything. That's for sure. But we do photo detection. We do photo detection, and how do we do photo detection? Microwaves are kind of like a big community. They're really looking at generating photo detector in microwave domain is, uh, we don't do it in the hardware side, we do it in the software side. So meaning that I'm collecting all of the signal either, and in the post-processing, I build a kind of like uh, um, digitally implemented photo detection, meaning that I'm reconstructing A and A dagger for signal and either, and then I, I making a photo detector in a digital way, which A dagger A and then the mean value of that. So one claim, you could, one thing you could just write, hey, this is then is not so useful because it's slow, it is really slow. If you could have better measurement chain, like if you have a photo detector, it would be way more efficient. That's why we cannot really detect anything movable. So the object we had was pretty fixed in some one point. If it moves, slower than our measurement uh, speed, then you can claim, hey, this could also work, but it's really slow measurements. So, uh, I think each, each measurement takes like one or two seconds. So if you have like turtle or something like that moving that slow, probably you can measure it. <laughs> it's, used, uh, it's not really useful for now. It's a proof of principle, but it's the first step, you know. Yeah, but because I, I had in mind, if you do the um, intensity measurement, then, then you also don't have to worry that much about uh, efficiencies or background noise because this all, uh, um, you, you can all put it out of the um, equations and then, 
Yeah, yeah that's how the optic people, they do it. They have photo detect and they're super happy about it. But you know, it's for <laughs> okay, optic people, it. my claim is really artificial because they don't have background noise. And the entire okay. point of a quantum illumination is noise and loss. So yeah. if you lose one of these, then probably is not so useful. That's why having microwave illumination probably is very useful. So it would be more useful if you push this to higher frequency, like 20 gigahertz above, which the, you have the transparency in the uh, atmosphere, then probably that would be even way more, um, uh, I mean, useful than what we have, which is the gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, something like that. Thanks. Okay, maybe I have a question. I, maybe you already answered it a little bit. Can you be, go back to this slide where you have the one meter? Uh, that's basically the last slide of the no. Oh, uh, last slide of the first part. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I was confused here with your with what you what you said here about this. First of all, the one meter, and second about correlations that persists beyond at room temperature or something like that. Yeah. Because I would have argued that at least as you go through the first mixer or something like that, your quantum the should be gone. Yeah. yeah. So what I mean about that is we just have, you know, that's what I mentioned uh, in the, for the, the first question. We have 50 ohm load here, which is kind of like a, just a terminator. And then we really calibrate the noise, start from this point to this point. So we calibrate out all of the noise in the gain here. So, but we don't have enough information about the cable from here to the sample. So we have some loss here. What I mentioned is we really, whatever we measure here, we backed out all of the correlation to these two points here and we don't have information about that. That's why the photons, whatever we have, we still have some losses in those two cables which still the entanglement we generated can handle those losses. So that's why I'm talking about one meter apart from each other. And about the second question, um, that was exactly what we tackled. You know, the entanglement here is totally gone. We don't have any entanglement. But we could claim we have entanglement here. But the quantum correlation in a larger scale in the form of quantum discord, which is for the separable state, they still exist in this system. So the this, this states, they are not, they are totally separable, but still you have quantum correlation, quantum discord, which is exactly, that's why quantum illumination is working, because you have non-negligible quantum discord at room temperature, mm -hmm. and that is ex the main point of quantum illumination. Thank you. Okay. Last chance. If not, let's, you. Oh, oh. So, so mine is, when you do your comparisons with the signal-to-noise ratios, yeah. there's a rate difference between um, generating down conversion sources like you are here. Yeah. Your system here has a certain speed, but, but typically um, if, I'm, if I just take a microwave signal and send it, I have a much higher rep rate. And the signal-to-noise, as we know, scales with the number of trials. So actually if you take the realistic speed of devices, and is there an advantage between those two windows? Or is, or is your is your advantage because you're taking, you're limiting the speed of the, um, the microwave source? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's another thing. But I mean, we're, we're far from that point. We stuck on this, the speed of our storage, the tangled source of this world, the bandwidth of our source. This is really limiting factor. And then, unfortunately, I mean, we didn't have better source. This JPC we got, we got it from IBM, we didn't fabricate here. And that was the best case. But I mean, it was still fine. We don't claim this is the best ever, but this is the, I would say this is one of the first realizations. Yeah, 